Very good. Um, a very warm uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, this is uh, Nicola Marzari from uh, ETFL, uh, and I have uh, the, the great pleasure today of uh, uh, hosting uh, Professor Georg Kresse from the University of Vienna for his uh, uh, 24th Marvel Distinguished Lecture on the finite temperature properties uh, with first principle accuracy. Is machine learning the way to go? Now, Georg uh, doesn't really need an introduction uh, to uh, any of you, uh, but just uh, to, to put uh, a few items on the map, uh, let me mention that uh, he first got his uh, PhD in uh, 1993 uh, at the TU Vienna, the Technical University of Vienna, uh, where he also got uh, his uh, habilitation. And uh, from 2007, instead, is at the University of Vienna as a full professor. Of course, uh, I mean, many or most of you will know him uh, for the development uh, of the quantum mechanical simulation code uh, VASP, that is uh, the most used code in the world for material simulation, and I think has really uh, pushed the density functional theory into the materials community at large. Um, I often say things like the Materials Genome Initiative in the United States, uh, uh, I don't think would have happened uh, if uh, we didn't have uh, uh, VASP. Uh, but of course, he has also an impressive uh, corpus of uh, scientific accomplishments, uh, uh, starting uh, in the 90s uh, with uh, molecular dynamics uh, from first principles uh, of uh, metals, semiconductors, uh, liquid metals, uh, and surfaces. Uh, surfaces uh, were very challenging because they are large, they are complex systems, so a lot of accomplishment uh, in, uh, in surface science. Uh, another uh, uh, major uh, area of research has been really uh, many body methods. Uh, and again, you know, pushing many body methods uh, to do actual material uh, research. And uh, I think uh, what we'll see today is uh, another third major area that has started uh, more recently and is really leveraging uh, machine learning and computer science idea, again, to predict uh, materials properties. Now, on the personal side, I don't know if Georg uh, remembers, but uh, we have known each other for 25 years. So we met at the University uh, of uh, Minnesota in Minneapolis for the electronic structure surface. Probably what he doesn't know is that uh, I knew him from quite a bit before, uh, because there was once a CASTEP school in Cambridge and a common friend of us, Alessandro De Vita, mentioned there is uh, you know, a young guy from Vienna and he's super bright. Uh, is going to do his military service, so you better uh, rush and try to do things uh, while he's, uh, he's uh, offline for, uh, for a few months. And that was uh, Alessandro indeed. So, Gerga, with this, uh, I'll uh, let the floor to you. Really a great pleasure and honor, and uh, please go ahead. And uh, you are muted. Yes. I'll mention yes, that I have uh, hit... Uh, 460 participants, so behave yes. well. <laughs> That's exactly my problem, right? Yes, I'm extremely glad that I, 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 I can present to you uh, our recent work. I'm also very glad that Nicola invited me uh, to this talk and presentation. Uh, yeah, 470 people are now listening. That's a pretty tough call. So I really have to concentrate and of course my my daughter just came into the living room and is now desperately searching for searching for her passport indeed okay so there might be some background noise but she's uh yeah she's not leaving the room so i should be it should become peaceful now okay nicola again uh, I, I know exactly that we know each other for quite some time i wasn't aware that we know each other with 25 years so I, I should i should remember but i tend to forget i'm getting a little bit old now uh, yes, uh, do I share my screen already or not? Yeah, you're all good to go. Okay, I'm good to go. So hopefully it still works. Yeah, is it still working? Because I don't see the green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. No, we see your screen. Yes, okay, great. So the topic of this talk is finite temperature properties with first principles uh, accuracy. Is machine learning the way to go? And I guess you can already guess the answer. Uh, I will actually present machine learning uh, to train force fields, uh, why we do this and how we do it. Uh, and I will present mostly applications to material sciences. Uh, the topic I will mostly concentrate on are phase transitions, which are really tough to predict with first principle methods. 
I will go from uh, increase from low complexity to higher complexity. Start with uh, the uh, phase transition from HCP zirconium to PCC zirconium. That's a Martin Sittig phase transition. I will then uh, discuss quickly melting temperatures of simple liquids, where we have used a completely different approach than above. Slightly more involved are the phase transitions in zirconia. I will show you actually that we can predict the phase transition from the monoclinic to the tetragonal to the cubic phase in zirconia. And finally, finish off with something that we have published actually originally uh, that's methyl ammonium lead iodine 3, but I'm not quite sure I will manage to get to, uh, to that point. And then I will finish uh, with conclusions. Um, yeah, let me say along this talk, I will present you various methods to calculate phase transitions, but time is a little bit limited. So I, I'm going most likely to rush a little bit about the precise methods we, we use to predict the phase transition. But just be aware there are very different means to calculate phase transitions. And in fact, we have used very different methods for all these uh, different problems. Uh, I think we all know uh, materials modeling and uh, I don't have to say this in front of a group uh, that is actually one of the drivers of first principle methods. Certainly we want to use the Schrodinger equation. Uh, the Schrodinger equation is the only way I would say to go parameter free to do true up initial calculations. In principle, of course, we would solve the many body Schrodinger equation, but I think most people agree it's an exponentially hard uh, problem. That means if you increase the number of electrons, uh, the compute time most of the time actually increases exponentially, except for specific cases like uh, large band gap insulators and so on and so on. But in principle, it could potentially scale exponentially for many problems. So most of us therefore use uh, density functional theory, uh, here picture of a uh, uh, cone. And essentially in this uh, theory, we don't solve for the many body wave function that depends on uh, where the wave function depends not only on a single coordinate, but on many coordinates. We solve this uh, density function theory uh, approach where our orbitals depend only on a single coordinate. And that's uh, much, much simpler and more convenient. So nowadays, uh, most of the codes are scaling cubically. I know there are linear scaling codes, but that's also limited to certain conditions. Most of the codes have a cubic system size scaling. And nowadays you can do something like on the order of 2000 electrons in a few minutes for one specific structure on a large computer where you can use multiple cores and nodes. So if you want, so the sledgehammer of all is density functional theory. I hear you use a word of Volker Heine. I think he has coined this and I've heard him almost 25, 30 years ago talking about density functional theory. Again, that's the sledgehammer of all. So essentially it's reasonably fast, it's reasonably accurate. Uh, and maybe most important, you can calculate first derivatives extremely fast. And that's maybe the most important property of density function theory. Typically a force calculation can take less time than actually one self consistency step. And, and don't underestimate that's a, an enormous beneficial property of density function theory. All the other theories I've looked at will take typically 10 times longer to calculate forces or even 100 times longer to calculate forces on the atoms. You can also calculate second derivatives quite straightforwardly, which gives you vibrational properties and elastic properties and so on and so on. Just here a quick uh, shot on, on what density function theory can do. That's for liquids. Again, the thing I did uh, almost 20 years ago this is in principle the structure factor, but very similar is the pair correlation function, where you actually measure the likelihood to find an atom at a certain distance. Uh, and uh, you have typically a first peak, structure factor and pair correlation function look pretty similar. You have a first peak where there's a high likelihood to find atoms. And then there's a kind of minimum uh, where uh, you, you actually, no, that's not what I wanted. Uh, Let's take the laser pointer where, you, where it's less likely to find atoms. That's kind of a forbidden or forbidden volume peak. So, and here nothing goes in, really nothing but the temperature and uh, essentially the, the nuclear charge. So that's all that goes in. And then you can predict and compare theory in the experiment and find the excellent agreement. Okay, so density function theory is fantastic. It's, it's very fast. It can be even applied at finite temperature. But if it comes to finite temperature properties, often you would like to do 100,000 time steps uh, to actually 
make serious predictions for phase transitions, and that's going to be still expensive. So we are talking about months of compute time on a high performance computer. Also, as said before, it's hardly applicable to more than 2000 electrons. That's kind of where you can go nowadays. And because of the cubic system size scaling, we are not going any further uh, in the foreseeable future. There are many workarounds for this. There are force fields, uh, cluster expansion methods, coarse graining methods, and these methods will probably continue to be developed. But there is, I would say, something like a new sledgehammer to use the work of Volker Heine, and that's machine learned force fields. So the sledgehammer of old density function theory now combined with the sledgehammer of new, if you want, so uh, uh, will solve and will allow us to solve a lot of material science problems that have been previously really hard uh, to solve. The basic principle of machine learning and machine learning force fields specifically is extremely simple. A, you construct the database. That's maybe the most difficult step, so to say. Uh, typically, you need up initial calculations for between 1,000 and 10,000 structures. And then you take your energies and forces and store it in this database. The second step is, well, potentially difficult. You have to choose a representation for the local environment. Uh, one assumption in machine learning force fields is that the forces are only dependent on the local environment. And somehow you have to kind of cast this local environment into a computable form, into a simple manageable form. And the last step is fairly straightforward. Once you have uh, done the, created the database and chosen the representation, you essentially do fitting. The fitting can be done either using neural networks or regression methods. So database choice, what, base, what how you represent your local environment. And finally, uh, you perform either regression or a neural network fit of the uh, total energies. So the database is here constructed using on the fly molecular dynamics, uh, something that Alessandro De Vita initialized uh, and I know Alessandro, I met him uh, in, in my Guinness group, uh, I think more than 25 years ago, or was it 24 years ago? Uh, his idea was really to do this on the fly training. And we have kind of picked up on this idea and tried to uh, work with this idea and then make it kind of workable for general purpose. Okay, so the descriptors, that's database. I will come that, to that a little bit later how we do that. But uh, the second step I told you is to actually uh, cast the local environment around each atom into a nice representation. And I don't want to mislead you. I think progress in this area has been really tiny over the last uh, 13, 20 years. Maybe there has been improved understanding, but uh, already in the work of Bela and Parinello, uh, that approach was kind of uh, settled and I would say hasn't changed since then. Well, there have been a little bit like Rococo and Baroque uh, additions to it, but if you come back to what it does in its essence, all the papers that came later still maintain the same sort of description. So what do you do? You want to describe actually uh, the local environment around each atom somehow, cast it into a simple computable form. You do that essentially by uh, actually developing the classical density distribution around this atom here into a set of simple computable numbers. Okay, how can you do that? Well, you can just represent the classical distribution of the atoms around the central atom into, uh, well, you can develop that density distribution into a basis set. For instance, in the product of spherical harmonics and uh, uh, spherical Bessel functions. Well, we specifically choose their spherical Bessel functions, but there are other choices possible for the regular basis set as well. So you cast essentially this distribution around each atom into a set of coefficients C, L, M, N. That's the first step. Now, this is in principle nice, but the disadvantage is that this representation is not rotationally invariant. And you desire a force field that is rotationally invariant. So the second step is to kind of tweak this a little bit bit and to recast that into two sets of descriptors. One are describing the bare correlation function, how likely it is to find other atoms at a certain distance. So you cast essentially this complex three-dimensional function into a pair correlation function and an angular correlation function. So the angular correlation function describes how likely it is to find one atom from the central atom I, one atom at the distance R, the second atom at the distance S, and both enclosing an angle theta. Okay, so 
essentially these coefficients then rewrite the local environment into a set of pair correlation functions and uh, angular correlation functions. Now, I was telling you this is really what uh, has been done already in the original work, and this is actually called in the original work symmetry functions. Bartok, uh, Jani actually later introduced something that is called the power spectrum, but in its essence, it's exactly the same as the radial and the angular correlation function point. You have choices for the basis functions, in particular for the uh, radial basis functions. Again, we choose uh, spherical basis functions because if you look at mass, this is how we construct our pseudo potentials, for instance. So it's something I was uh, familiar with, and that's why we picked it up. So the final step uh, is this regression. So you cast your local environment into a set of numbers, typically something like 100 numbers for each atom. For each central atom, you get 100 numbers. Now you propose that your energy or your property is a function of these coefficients. Uh, how to do this uh, straightforwardly is using neural networks, but uh, our approach is based on regression methods. Uh, and again, we have these uh, 100 coefficients, and now we have to describe a function of possibly quite high complexity that depends on these 100 coefficients. The standard way to do that would be actually to form a basis set in these 100 coefficients. Okay, that's not going to be simple. Imagine that you have two coefficients, x and y. How many basis functions would you need to describe an arbitrary function? Well, a constant, a function that depends on x, y, x squared, x, y, y squared, and then cubic functions, quartic functions, and so on and so on. So that's going to be pretty many functions that you potentially need to use. Well, once you have picked your functions, you have to determine the regression coefficients. So alpha actually index our functions. You have to determine the regression coefficients w alpha. Uh, the regression coefficients will be determined by fitting to a database. Now, the first person to actually do that was Sharpeth. He really introduced the basis set, if you want. So in, in this functional space of uh, descriptors, that actually is probably suitable to describe a function of arbitrary complexity, but that's going to be pretty tough. Imagine you have something like 100 coefficients in your uh, 100 different coefficients in this uh, vector that you want actually to include. So, what does machine learning to typically do uh, to actually work in such a high dimensional space? Well, it, one usually uses what is called now the kernel trick. So the idea for the kernel trick is very simple. You pick from all your calculations something like, say, 1,000, 2,000 atoms. Calculate the descriptors, the values of the coefficients in this vector for, all, for these 1,000 atoms. And this is then kind of your uh, basis set. XIB. So IB are 1,000 uh, local environments around something like 1,000 atoms. And then you define a kernel where you calculate a kernel that essentially measures and allows to determine the similarity between a desired atom and uh, uh, these uh, reference configurations. So this kernel is going to be one if these two are similar. It's going to be small if these are dissimilar. Uh, this trick actually goes back to Hoffman, Schoelberg, and Small, and probably it was even around before that, but it's a beautiful, in principle, exact mathematical trick to actually use what uh, you use in linear algebra and apply it to high dimensional nonlinear functions. Well, I cannot explain the details, and I'm sure many people already know machine learning, but I want to give at least those few that don't know it an idea how it works. So you have your structures, which are characterized by uh, these uh, vectors. Each structure will give a different uh, value for the vector. Here I've represented the vector as a simple scalar. This is the first structure, x1. This is the fourth structure, x4. Uh, essentially, the kernel is usually something like an exponential that essentially gives one if x agrees with x4, or here one if x agrees with x1. So essentially, you place kind of uh, these exponential functions on each of your reference structures, if you want so. And then you try to fit this function p of x by fitting it to a database. So essentially what you do is you say essentially scale each of these exponentials by their respective weight, vrd, and then you have these exponentials. If you sum the exponentials, you get an approximation for the original uh, functional behavior, uh, which might be the blue curve, you get an approximation, which is then described by this uh, 
uh, orange curve here. Again, the kernel trick allows to use and recycle all ideas uh, from linear algebra, the single value decomposition that you can use after you apply the kernel tricks. It's, it's really quite straightforward. Again, it means that nonlinear problems are now amendable to what you have been doing in linear algebra. That's a beautiful trick in principle. Okay, so we are not the only one to use the kernel trick. Of course, also Gabo Chan uses the kernel trick or some monic of the some similar trick as the kernel trick to essentially solve his regression problems. So the thing where we are a little bit different is probably this on the fly learning. How does it work? Typically, we start with reading from an existing uh, database, uh, construct the force field, and then we make a prediction for the energies and forces on each of the atoms. So this prediction comes not only along with energies and forces, but this prediction also predicts an uncertainty. Specifically, we pick the uncertainty for the forces for each atom. So we calculate the uncertainty of the predicted forces for each atom. And if the uncertainty is above a certain threshold, well, then we need to perform first principles calculations. That's tightly integrated into VASP3. Just kick off VASP, run the machine learning. And if necessary, VASP will do the first principles calculation. Uh, this additional data is then added to the data set. This new structure is added to the data set. And after acquiring typically something like five uh, new up initial data sets, we return the force field on the fly and continue. Now, depending on whether we have done the first principles calculation or use the force field, uh, we essentially update Newton's equation using either the force field or the forces from the first principle simulation, move the atoms, integrate the equation of motions and continue to run. Now, it's clearly important that the uncertainty measure is a good estimator for the real error, right? You have to have a fast means to calculate the potential error in the forces. And to do that, we use what is called the Bayesian variance. Uh, it's essentially the diagonal of the covariant matrix. Specifically, it's this part of the covariant matrix that we calculate for the experts. Again, this allows us to estimate error in the predicted force on each atom. If that is large, we do the first principle calculation. If that is small, we continue with the force field. So it turns out that uh, this uh, predicted error is actually a good measure for the real error. What I show you here is a simulation for methyl ammonium. That's a certain ion here. This is a uh, carbon, nitrogen, and six hydrogen atoms. Uh, this methyl ammonium ion is actually moving inside the cage of lead iodine 3. And what you see here is uh, the uh, predicted error in red and the true error, which we have calculated a posteriori by performing first principles calculations and comparing the force field with uh, the first principle calculation. What you see here is that the predicted error very closely follows the real error. Now we have done this. I mean, this is still one of the nicest graphs because there's some physical origin by the error suddenly it goes up. It's because the methyl ammonium molecule in this specific case here at uh, around uh, time steps after 0 to 2 uh, picosecond reorient itself. So it starts rotating in the cage and explores a new site, a new absorption site if you want so. And uh, that leads a large Bayesian error, but also a large uh, true, true error in the first principles calculation. And this tells our code, okay, you have to rerun the first principle calculations uh, to actually improve the force field. Now, we have done this now for many systems and we have observed exactly the same behavior. So say also for a carbon monoxide observed on the surface when the CO hops, error gets large and then we need to return. One last thing here, uh, even so we use uh, the kernel method. At the end of the day, we have to solve a regression problem for the weights W, phi, we call usually uh, uh, psi, we call usually the design matrix and Y is actually our predicted energies and forces. So this is kind of the problem we need to solve at the end of the day. We have to minimize this. Uh, I've rewritten this problem here, uh, psi W is equal Y. We want to solve for W, so W is the unknown. How you do this usually? Well, you multiply from the left-hand side with the transpose of the design matrix, psi T. Psi T, Psi W is equal to Psi T Y. And then you invert uh, or kill this term here by multiplying with the inverse of Psi T Psi. Okay, this kills this term here. And then we are left with Psi T Psi to the power of minus one times Psi T Y. 
This here is famous. This is the normal equation. If you have done ever a solution of a regression problem, that's exactly the normal equation. And that's what virtually all machine learning codes use inside under the hood. Well, they regularize that equation, which is written down here. So usually the problem is that this matrix is potentially ill-conditioned. It might have zero modes. So inverting this matrix here can be a numerically unstable problem. So to solve that, one usually regularizes the equation by adding a little bit of the unity matrix to this. Well, there are different variants of this, but in the gist, this is what you do in order to allow uh, the inversion of this matrix in a fairly robust manner. And that gives you finally then the weights W that you need in the regression. Small twist here, we have decided ultimately because we've looked at the conditioning number of this matrix and in many, many cases, the conditioning number of this matrix here approached one over the machine position. So the conditioning number of that guy here becomes 10 to the 16. And that's unpleasant because it means you have irrevertibly lost information. So recently we switched over to what we call either QR or SVD methods where we actually take this matrix and there are sparse methods to use to do this. We actually calculate the pseudo inverse of the design matrix using SVD and then perform a pseudo inversion. Uh, actually it turns out that this is not a big step forward but slightly improves the problem or slightly improves the force fields at the end by something like 10, 20, 30%, depending on, on the property you look at, you can get slightly more accurate source fields by actually replacing the normal solution of the normal equation by a similar value decomposition. So I've given you pretty much everything I wanted to tell you about theory. I will show you now applications. So the first thing is uh, the zirconium metal. Uh, the zirconium metal is a metal exhibiting a martensitic phase transition from HCP to BCC. It's technologically relevant since it's highly corrosion resistant and stable at very high temperatures. It's, for instance, used because of these properties uh, for reactor encasings, for instance, in submarines, uh, because it's so uh, extremely hard and very, very uh, resistant against high temperatures. And in principle, it would be exceedingly interesting to uh, study hydrogen and oxygen in pricklement or radiation damage in this material. That's not where we went. Actually, what we wanted to do is we want to describe, you see here the phase diagram, the phase transition from the HP, HCP phase, the alpha phase to the beta phase, that's the BCC uh, uh, zirconium phase. So how did we do the training? Well, I told you we use on the fly training. So the only thing we did really, literally the only thing we did, we just took HCP zirconium and heated it up and run in the background our uh, machine learning approach. Uh, we also looked at the BCC phase. We also started out from the BCC phase at 1,600 Kelvin and cooled that one back to zero temperature. So we did a few more small heating runs, but in a gist, we just heated and cooled. Here's our force field. Here you see the DFD energies versus the machine learned force field energies. And you see that this is pretty much a straight line. You get actually typical errors that you have uh, if you train from a database. Here, the DFD forces and the machine learned forces straight line indicates that we have very good predictions. You will see later different plots uh, that uh, convey a slightly different message. But here, the gist is that we get a very good uh, description of both the DFD energies, the forces, and the stress tensor. Here, we look at uh, the energies for certain snapshots. Essentially, we show here the difference between DFD and the machine learned force field energy difference per atom for a 48 atom unit cell. And what you see here is that. Yes, it's not a perfect agreement, but it agrees both quite well for the HCP phase, which is on the left, as well as for BCC phase. Uh, here we have snapshots taken from uh, 500K molecular dynamics and 1,400K molecular dynamics. The two different lines are actually either the singular value decomposition in red, that's the slightly improved one uh, that to cope with the conditioning or all standard Bayesian regression, that solves the normal equation. But you see already that errors are pretty transferable or pretty similar for both. Here, I show you the lattice constants. Uh, the lattice constants for DFD and for the machine learned force field here, only the SVD results uh, agree very well. Uh, and we get essentially the same energy difference for the static BCC structure. That's not truly BCC, that's just a snapshot. 
uh, in a primitive unit cell, we get pretty good agreement between DFD and the machine learned force field. Where actually the SVD is better, is in predicting properties that are not quite inside uh, the regime where we fitted our force field. Our force field was essentially fitted by heating HCP to PCC at zero pressure. Still, we can describe volume fluctuations very well and describe also the energy volume behavior very well. And the uh, SVD does better so than the Bayesian regression, which is actually the topic. But overall, again, very good agreement. So up in issue is actually the full black line here and the red line here. The SVD is essentially the blue dashed line here and uh, the blue dashed line here. So SVD is a little bit better in forecasting uh, properties. The SVD, pace really off and starts to show slight improvements is actually for the phonon frequencies. Here, the DFD results are, the again, the, the broken lines. And you see this here is the SV, this here is the Bayesian regression. So in the normal equation, this here is the SVD, which is certainly closer to the uh, perfect results. There's one point here I have to make. These phonons here have been actually predicted for a quite large unit cell, both for DFD as well as for the uh, machine learned force field, but the machine learned force field has been trained only on 48 atoms. Here actually phonons were not our focal point. We wanted just to calculate phase transition temperatures. And that one we will achieve with exquisite precision. But the phonons, the main source of the error in the phonons is related to the fact that we have trained only on small unit cells. What you can also see here is that we predict instabilities both in DFD as well as in the machine learned force fields for these uh, soft phonon branches, which are supposed to be unstable. So BCC is not stable, it's not a stable ground state structure, it shows dynamic instabilities. Uh, yes, so elastic constants are also in great agreement between uh, our machine learned force field again, SVD is definitely better than uh, the Bayesian regression. And otherwise we have again, very good agreement between DFD and the machine learned force field, both for BCC zirconium as well as for HCP zirconium. So, Phase transition. This is what we really want. So we actually went for a 180 atom atorhombic cell, and here we were lucky for uh, zirconium. But just heating, this is the black line. Uh, by just heating HCP zirconium, we observe actually the phase transition. So it runs towards uh, BCC. Here it's BCC. If you cool, uh, actually you have to super cool it a little bit, but then it flips back to HCP. So lucky strike. In this case, with this unit cell, you can just directly heat and cool the system and it will reversibly uh, go and phase transform either here in HCP or to BCC at higher temperatures. So we did this simple computer experiment four times with very slow heating rates. And these are predicted uh, transition temperatures up on cooling and up on heating. And you already see, you can take the average of this value, take the average of that value, and calculate the mean. You see that uh, this will give you a value of 1046, which is accidentally also the upper temperature from cooling and the lower temperature from heating. So we are fairly confident that this is actually a very precise estimate of the transition of the melting temperature using the machine learned force field. So lucky strike, that was simple. But can we be sure? That the machine learned force field was adequate, was precise, was good enough. Well, to end, to actually evaluate this, you can do uh, uh, you can do thermodynamic perturbation theory. In order to do that, you have actually to calculate uh, for these 180 atom cells the first principles and energy, subtract the energy you predict with the machine learned force field divided by KPT from the exponential and take the expectation value of over many configurations and then calculate the logarithm. This is called thermodynamic perturbation theory. You do this both for PCC structures as well as for HCP structures at the melting point. And this here gives you an estimate for the free energy difference. To be quite precise, we didn't use that. We do use what is called second order cumulant expansion, which is only the Taylor expansion to second order of the above. Now, what is the upshot of this calculation? It shows that our error in the relative free energy difference is only 0 0.27 milli electron volt per atom. So our calculations, our machine learning force field is precise to 0 0.27 milli electron volt per atom for the free energy difference. So it's pretty much exact. There's no need actually to correct in this specific case for the errors caused by the machine learning force field.
Okay, that was simple. Let's do something a little bit more involved, melting temperatures. Melting temperatures, actually this was the first thing I did in my thesis. I was predicting melting temperatures or rather amorphization temperatures of germanium. There's always something I like to come back to liquids. I also did it uh, when I was in my killing group uh, 20 years ago and uh, when Alessandro De Vito was there. So melting. Uh, here we use the method uh, that was uh, come up and invented by Ulf Pedersen. Uh, it's a method that is called interface melting. Essentially, you actually have a block of material where you actually have joined the crystal with the liquid, and then again, the crystal because of periodic boundary conditions. Now, the key point of this interface spinning method is that you uh, apply a bias field that you couple to an order parameter yeah, in order to keep the size of the liquid and the crystal block equal. So, the order parameter you couple essentially an external driving force, and this driving force is determined such that you get an equilibrium or equal size of crystal and liquid uh, structure in your simulation set. We did this crazy enough. We using first principle methods already right in 2013. I'll tell you one thing: this took one million CPU hours. Now CPUs haven't become much faster, so it would still take one million CPU hours, maybe half a million CPU hours to do it nowadays. Machine learning is much, much faster. So once we have trained the machine, we are typically 10,000, sometimes 1,000 to 10,000 times faster. Okay, so this is really easy to do. And uh, we actually did it uh, to, to actually calculate the melting temperature of silicon, germanium, aluminum, and magnesium oxide using different functionals. Uh, first things first, uh, in some cases, specifically from silicon and from magnesium oxide, we had reference data calculated by uh, determining where the free energy of the liquid and the solid is the same, using everything entirely calculated from first principles. Now, this interface spinning result is within 1% in agreement with the uh, previous accurate uh, estimates we did with first principles. But uh, here we had to correct the error. And the same thing I just explained to you, we had to correct the errors that we introduced for the machine learning force fit. So the errors between the liquid and the solid were not quite as transferable as it was for PCC and HCP zirconium. So we had to apply a slight correction. You see this typically corrects the melting error by something like three to 5%. But anyway, this is an acceptable calculation to require us to do you about 50 to 100 first principle calculations, both for the liquids as for the liquid structures, as well as for the solid structures. So quite an acceptable thing. Okay, again, the errors for the corrected uh, results are within, I think, one or even smaller, zero to five percent of the accurate predictions we did entirely with first principles. But the compute time this took was pretty much nothing. I mean, maybe it took five thousand CPU hours, maybe maybe ten thousand CPU hours, and then everything was done. Okay, physics. Let's look a little bit at the physics. What is the best functional? I've marked the best functional yellow, and what you see. On first side is actually scan by and large. And here scan for aluminum is also in quite good agreement. This experiment PD salt does a little bit better, but by and large, scan gives a very adequate description. But be aware for germanium, for instance, you predict definitely even using scan a way too low melting temperature, 10% too small. For silicon, you predict a way too high melting temperature compared to experiment. RPA here gives, by the way, a very good result. Uh, for the other materials, scan is quite acceptable. So this is really showing you that uh, A, we have still to be careful with density functional theory. B, it shows you that actually you can do calculations that otherwise would either take a lot of human time or a lot of uh, uh, compute time in a couple of hours, essentially, or a couple of days. Okay, something slightly more involved, zirconia. Uh, zirconia is an ultra hard uh, insulator with excellent high temperature stability. It's for instance used for diamond uh, imitates. It's technologically relevant. I told you already zirconium is the zirconium metal is used uh, for reactor encasings. Of course, there's always in contact with water and oxygen. So it will usually oxidize. But here our interest is in describing the phase diagram of uh, zirconia. So it's quite challenging. You have to actually transition from a low symmetry monoclinic phase over a tetragonal phase to a high symmetry cubic phase. But in reality, the cubic phase or atoms in the cubic phase are highly mobile. So they are moving around. So they are not really static in the sense 
but they are really dynamically moving around between the different phases, essentially locally exploring the monoclinic and tetrodomal phase. Similar things as before, first we create the force field essentially again by just training. Uh, in this case, we heated the monoclinic structure, the tetrodomal structure, both uh, up to the temperatures where the cubic structure becomes anyway stable. Uh, here again, phonons, uh, this were training on a much larger unit cell. What you see here on the phonons, the root mean square are smaller for the singular value decomposition than for solving the normal equation. So we get a slight improvement precision. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's for the energies. Ah, yeah, that's, that's actually an evaluation using a test set. So you see that the SVD has better predictions for both the energy, the forces, and the stress tensor on the test set. And what you see, it also predicts better form and frequencies, slightly better form and frequencies than the normal equation. This here is also an interesting plot. It shows the error in the machine learning force field as a function, as the, uh, as a function of the predicted energy per atom. And what you see here is that the errors are very small for those structures that are close to T is equal to zero. So T equal zero structures are here. High temperature structures are here. They are higher in energy, right? Yeah, so they are higher in energy. So they are more or less to the right. And what you see here is that the uh, prediction error in the way we have chosen our and constructed our force field are actually smaller at low temperatures. This is usually guaranteed by slowly heating. Yeah? And uh, errors are somewhat larger at higher temperatures. Now, here we did again the same thing as before. We first uh, tried to heat our monoclinic structure. And indeed, there is a transition to the tetragonal structure but the hysteresis is large. That is, it occurs much later than in the experiment. The second phase transition from the tetragonal to the cubic phase is again reversal. So you heat, you go from the tetragonal to cubic structure, you cool, you go from the cubic to the tetragonal structure. And the cubic structure is essentially really highly dynamically disordered phase, uh, disordered phase. But the tetragonal structure is really clearly distinct from the monoclinic structure. This is still higher in entropy, and there's no way to go back from the uh, high entropy phase, the tetragonal structure in this case, to the monoclinic phase. So cooling never goes back to the monoclinic structure, at least not in the time frames that were accessible to us. Anyway, we can quite straightforwardly compare our lattice constants, A, B, C for the monoclinic phase with experiment, A, C for the tetragonal phase, and finally for the cubic phase, you see almost perfect agreement with experiment. Here you see the C over C minus A divided by A for the uh, essentially tetragonal phase. And you see that our data points are pretty much on top of experiment shown as uh, the valid points. Okay, so direct heating and cooling does not work here. Uh, the interface method doesn't work either because it only works if you have uh, one set of material is a liquid. So how did we calculate in the melting temperature in, or the transition temperature in this case? Well, we have chosen actually to do, again, thermodynamic integration, free energy integration. In this case, we just integrate it from a reference temperature, T0, up to the desired temperature. This is the enthalpy. So essentially, if you can calculate the enthalpy, and the enthalpy is a quantity you can actually deduct from the simulations. It's just the expectation value of the internal energy. So the enthalpy you can calculate in your VASP calculations or in your machine learning force field calculations divided by the temperature at which you're running and integrate over the temperature gives you the change in the free energy if you integrate that from the temperature T0 to T. This is, by the way, exactly how experiments measure the free energy. So we just thought, okay, why not use exactly this type of G experimental use? The only problem is you have to have the free energy at some reference temperature T0. And here we chose the quasi harmonic approximation and the temperature of uh, something like uh, 100 Kelvin, if I remember correctly, and then we integrate it essentially uh, using this equation to obtain the free energy of both the tetragonal as well as the cubic phase. Okay, then the transition temperature is the one where the free energy of the cubic uh, of the tetragonal phase is equal to the one of the monoclinic phase, and we get a prediction for the uh, phase transition temperature, which in this case happens to be 1500 Kelvin. Or 1,493 Kelvin, which is actually an excellent agreement with the experimental value of 1,400 Kelvin. One small thing here, if you use the quasi-harmonic approximation, all the way up to higher temperatures, you get much too low estimate for the transition temperature. This is a highly unharmonic material, so the quasi-harmonic approximation is not good enough to calculate uh, 
transition temperatures, you have to do uh, some way of free energy perturbation theory or free energy integration to get the right result. Now, another thing we can do, machine learning gives you local energies. When you have local energies, there's a trivial equation to calculate the heat transport. The only moniker is that you have these local energies, energy as a function of the local environment. But that's exactly what our machine learning force field did. And so you can calculate the heat transport from the machine learned force field. Uh, we did this for zirconia. You see here the red dots uh, using error bars. Uh, you see our curve that we have obtained and you see the experimental data for zirconia. Uh, this is a material where you cannot easily use Boltzmann equation because it's so highly anharmonic, or at least the errors will be fairly large using the Boltzmann transport equation. Using machine learning force fields, uh, green Kubo simulations in this specific case, we get actually very nice agreement uh, with the uh, experimental data or fairly large temperature machine. Uh, again, this cannot be done with first principles for two reasons. A, you don't have local energies that lost nothing vast, and B, because the required runtimes would simply not be feasible. Good. Now, quick step aside. I've shown you now quite some results for density function theory. Can we do this for methods beyond DFT? Of course we can, and our favorite one is the random phase approximation that we have used over almost a decade now. It has cubic system size scaling as DFD, and very important, we can also calculate forces. Uh, this was published in this paper. So we know the forces. We cannot calculate the stress tensor. So we worked around that problem by doing finite differences for the stress tensor using total energies, RPA energies, and calculating from that essentially the stress tensor. Uh, actually, RPA is excellent, and we have made many excellent predictions for argon, neon, ice, graphite, CO, and benzene adsorption on uh, metal substrate. Let this constants uh, in very good agreement with the experiment. So, of course, it's still expensive to do it. So, we did a little bit of a trick. We first trained the uh, on the fly force field using DFT. We created a data set for, in this case, again, zirconia with 592 structures, uh, in this case, 96 atoms. And this was our first machine learning force field, the one pretty, mon pretty much the same as the one I've showed you before. But here we used PBE. The results I showed you here. I this PB is all because that gives the best lattice constant. On purpose, we now pick the slightly worse machine uh, base functional PB that has a larger error for the uh, lattice constant. So uh, we set out from BB. And then we actually uh, do what is now commonly termed delta learning, uh, has been introduced uh, by uh, Anatole van Lilienfeld. So essentially, how did we do this? We picked smaller structures with 24 atoms ran again the first principle molecular dynamics, which gave us 1,275 snapshots. We used SVD to rank compress that to the most important uh, 168 structures of 24 atoms. And for these 168 structures, we performed RPA calculations. Calculated both the energies, the forces, the stress tensor using finite differences. And with that, we then calculated the difference between PVE and RPA and trained the difference uh, uh, to another machine learning force field. At the end, this correction are then extrapolated for these 592 structures with 96 atoms. So we correct the original PBE data set using this RPA correction. And this corrected data set is then fed back into our machine learning code to retrain it. That has the advantage at the end, we have a single machine learning force field that captures both PBE plus the corrections. How good is it? Uh, well, we first tried the same thing for scan. So we set out from PBE and used as the correction, the scan function. PBE gives too large volumes, scan gives very nice volumes. PBE has not so good phonons, scan has much better phonons. So there's a sizable correction stemming from scan. So, it, but of course for scan, we can also do the entire calculation and all the required calculations for the original 592 structures using scan. So this is our reference that we can compare to. And what this plot essentially shows you, there is no difference between machine learned scan and the machine learned scan function using delta training. So the red and the blue line, which should be the same, are pretty much identical. So this delta learning, where we learn the difference between PD and scan, and the direct training using scan gives the same result. 
Now let's look at the RPA where we did the same thing. Here it's a little bit difficult uh, to compare to, but we calculated uh, the phonons of the monoclinic tetragonal and cubic structure using the RPA. These are the blue dots and the machine learned force field is actually shown in red. And you see it's perfectly on top of the accurate RPA calculations for the phonon frequencies. For the monoclinic tetragonal and cubic structure, you see actually there is a correction because the gray one is the PBE result. So the correction is pretty sizable. Uh, we also uh, evaluated RP, the force filter against uh, some training set, and we find that the errors are pretty much the same as if you do straightforward training of PBE or scan. Now, the only unhappy thing, if you want so, is that the RP in this particular case is not much, not much better than uh, uh, scan itself. So what you see here is, uh, sorry, I shouldn't says can not much better than PB sol. That's the one result I showed you at the beginning. These were trained for PB sol. Here on this slide, we, we do slight little cheating. We show actually scan results. Scan slightly overestimates the volume. RPA much does much much better. Uh, what you see is essentially that we can now use the machine learning force field to uh, predict the lattice constants of the monoclinic structure and tetragonal structure and with RPA they are in pretty nice agreement, even slightly better than scan. We can now also calculate uh, using the machine learned RPA potential the uh, transition temperature. We find actually uh, that our transition temperature is 1308 degree using the RPA, which compares quite nicely with the experiment, which is 1400 Kelvin, but it's a little bit too low. Uh, uh, PB soil and scan actually yield a little bit too large temperatures. So at the end of the day, for this specific case, RPA doesn't do so much better than either PB soil or scan. But anyway, as a principle, you can see that we can apply this delta learning and learn a force field that has the same quality as the random phase approximation. Good. Um, very quickly, uh, this year I have already presented. I think twice, and it's already published quite some time ago, but I will give you a brief uh, monitor of this for a much more complex material. Here we have a five component system that's uh, methyl ammonium. Uh, this is this uh, small molecule here. It's an organic molecule. It's uh, carbon, nitrogen, and six hydrogen atoms. Uh, it's shown here. And essentially this molecule has one electron too much that it gives to the cage. The cage is made up by lead iodine three lead iodine three. So this misses one electron. And this one electron is transferred from the metal ammonium to the lead iodine. So the, the system is complicated because the metal ammonium is mostly from the Waals bonded to the cage, but there's also a lot of electrostatic interaction going on. One electron being transferred from the metal ammonium to the lead iodine. Very quickly, we did similar things as before, machine learned on the fly training. Uh, here, the challenge is that the metal ammonium starts rotating, so you really have to scan the energy surface uh, uh, properly and find a temperature, and this is a nice way to do that. Here, we used umbrella sampling to determine the free energy difference at a different set of temperatures. So the different set of temperatures we calculated using umbrella sampling, the free energy difference between the monoclinic and detagonal phase, and in this manner predicted uh, essentially the phase transition temperature. Let's see whether I can, I can start this here, this simulation. Nope, I cannot. Nope. Yeah. I don't know. No, Tiger option. No. Ah, I will leave the molecular dynamics out. Uh, essentially, you can heat the material and then you have a transition first from the orthorhombic phase to the tetragonal phase. And why does this not work here? So if I'm in this Zeiger option, I cannot start this. It's very strange. Hmm. Ah, doesn't I think work. You need to go back to cursor mode from laser pointer. And Which one is this cursor mode? Uh, the first laser one. pointer. No, it's laser pointer, stift, text marker, file option. This is crazy, right? I mean, why does this not work? Ah, now it's this way. Okay, very quickly uh, in the in the monoclinic phase, the, the guys are frozen in the metal ammonium ions. If you then move from the orthorhombic phase to the detagonal phase, you start having rotations. Yeah. So some of your molecules here, for instance, start to jump rotate, 
every typically three picoseconds. So here you see the jump rotation. And finally, if you go to the cubic phase, which is the high temperature phase, you have complete chaos. Essentially, the metal ammonium molecules become free rotors. That's what you see on this molecular dynamics. We can again compare the predicted uh, lattice constants uh, between machine learning and the experiment and get very good agreement. You scan this in, initially the metal ammonium is kind of uh, frozen in. So these are the orientations of the metal ammonium molecule either in this direction or in that direction. Um, yeah, so either in this direction or that direction, then it starts to jump rotate around this uh, different uh, set of configurations. And finally, in the cubic phase, it becomes a free rotor. We did the same thing for a lot of different materials, metal ammonium, cesium lead iodine 3, cesium uh, lead iodine, let bromide and so on and so on and predicted uh, the phase transition temperatures for all of them again with very, very little compute time. Now, this looks all beautiful. And unfortunately, I have not a lot of time left. I just want to throw one more thing on you. One thing we should be aware of is that machine learning force fields are entirely agnostic. And that's something we knew and it's something that is still rather rarely shown in talks. So I think where well, they are obviously completely data-driven and they have absolutely no insight. Here's one thing we did. We learned actually silicon phases, but we on purpose omitted the ST12 phase. You would hope if you train on cubic diamond, hexagonal diamond, PCA, beta tin, simple hexagonal, HCP prime, HCP, BCC, FCC, you would hope that the force field should somehow predict something for SD12, which is after all not such dissimilar structures from some structures that are in the state set. But no, it's not. The result here is this one from the machine learned force field. And that's almost 100 or 200 milli electron volt off from the right result. So it knows only what it looks at and what it has seen. Now there's this paper by Gabo Chani where he claims he has a kind of general purpose force field. He should have rather written, he has a general purpose force field for all the things he has actually trained and put in. Whenever we try this, the force field is absolutely incapable to predict anything outside the test set. So when the local environments change, the results are outrageously wrong. Okay, this is a word of caution. Before I finish, I want to say who did the work, Menno Bogdan did the metal ammonium, let I even see. The Oske and Ferenc Kasai wrote most of the machine learning code, uh, Kala, and the uh, Paitao's application are the zirconium and the zirconium metal where uh, Paitao recently did the Delta learning with the RPA. Uh, I thank all the other people in my group. I thank you for listening. And here's my final, final summary. I think there's no question. Finite temperature materials modeling is at our fingertip. It has never been before from my point of view. Machine learning can essentially resolve the intricacies of complex materials. And the amount of data, I haven't shown you this, but the amount of first principles data you need is shockingly small. So for any of the materials you've seen here, we have hardly ever done more than 1,000 first principles calculations. And that's a little bit shocking. So first, 1,000 first principles simulations are entirely sufficient to parameterize force fields for metal ammonium and lead iron and zirconium metal, zirconium, so that's really, and for all the melts as well. So typically 1000 first principle calculations for the liquid are sufficient to know everything that is relevant about the melt. So this clearly shows machine learning is not a hype. Uh, it actually, another thing I want to say here, I heard a talk and uh, I also read a paper in 1993 by Volker Heine, where Volker Heine was arguing that we are incapable to construct force fields even for such simple things as aluminum. He called this the glue scheme, and he showed that there is no general purpose glue scheme potential that will work equally well for different aluminum phases. Now, this is quite a change here. With the machine learning force fields, we are obviously able to get very, very precise force fields for virtually all the relevant materials properties. But be assured, these new force fields have absolutely no insight whatsoever. They are just data run through a fitting engine. So they only work in the limited space space that you have trained them on. So it's totally agnostic. From my point of view, it's a little bit too physics, too little physics in there. I mean, for something like VASP where you run the machine learning in the background, that's 
beautiful because you still need us. I think there's absolutely no hope, at least not in the foreseeable future, to have a general purpose, even silicon potential that works for every conceivable structure. So the final thing I want to mention is learning post DFT methods, say the RP is already possible. And I think it's only taking maybe a couple of few more years actually to make this routinely available for say something like coupled cluster methods. With that, I thank you for your attention and uh, await questions. Thank you. Great, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Gerg, for the fantastic talk. Uh, you'll be happy to know that you have broken the internet. Uh, and so we beat uh, the previous record of David Vanderbilt and Raffaele Resta by a 508. 570 <laughs> attendees at a certain point. So there are a number of questions in the question and answers. Maybe I'll start uh, with a few of those. Uh, people are also uh, welcome to raise their hand and then uh, I'll uh, unmute them. Uh, so let me take uh, a few, uh, maybe one from the question and answers from uh, Luca Giringelli. Uh, he says, uh, since an on the fly force field is typically non-conservative, uh, is this uh, an issue under control, uh, example with some thermostatting? Or yes. it could potentially very good question. Yes, I must be very clear here. We distinguish between training phase and application phase. I didn't say this very clearly. I have no time to actually delve into this, but we do the training, and during the training, we use always a Langevin thermostat, which is obviously also not energy conserving. To create the ensembles, we use a Langevin thermostat. We do the training, and once the training is finished, we then apply the force feed usually in a much larger unit cell, we still have the possibility to check for the Bayesian errors. So even when we apply the force field, we can check and monitor the Bayesian errors, but we usually are not able to kick off the first principles calculations. Well, for instance, for, the, uh, for this uh, melting calculations, we have like 1,000, 2,000 atoms. It still runs kind of inside us, but it doesn't kick off the first principles engine. So conservation is a problem. During training, we give up energy conservation, momentum conservation, use, uh, lunge, uh, use essentially Langevin thermostat just to kick us around in configuration in space. Thanks. Production sir. is then conserving because we do not allow the initial calculations to kick back in. Yeah. Another quick question from the chat, Martin Hurin. Uh, what is the kernel that you use? Uh, is it so? Or is it something else? I don't know what soap, what the soap kernel is. Oh, the I mean, this is I think it, the smooth over. Yeah, I know, I know. But Gaba is has been not very precise what soap gap is. So, uh, do we use the soap kernel? I mean, he. I would say we use a polynomial kernel. We use the same polynomial kernel as Gabo Chan suggested. I think we could use an exponential kernel equally well. I don't think it would make any difference but we use the same polynomial kernel as Gabo Chani has suggested. Whether this is SOAP is unclear to me. I think SOAP means uh, smooth overlap atomic densities and so on and so on. But I, I think this rather means the set of descriptors he has chosen, but really this remains open. Reading all the papers, it's still not clear what exactly is SOAP. Okay, so we have to invite. We'll have to invite Gabo. Uh, let me get a question. No, but, uh, but, but let's be precise. I think soap is the moniker for his entire approach for all the ingredients he is putting together. Yeah. And I think one should value this. All the ingredients together are what makes up soap. Soap gap, maybe that's the best moniker for his method. So we have some things we have in common and some things we handle differently. Our descriptors are definitely different. Uh, we have angular and radial descriptors. He has this power kernel. Otherwise, there are a lot of similarities, yes. Cool. Let me take a few questions live. Uh, I'll go through the uh, uh, Fabio Finocchi, please. Uh, thank you, Nicola. There was a, I was just uh, asking the question, I mean, uh, in a written uh, format, but okay. First of all, I thank you, Georg, for this uh, nice, very nice talk. And I was just wondering whether the zero point energy was included in your computed uh, free energy. And uh, if yes, uh, how does it, uh, I mean, uh, shift the transition temperatures? This could be 
uh, the case, for example, of silicon or other materials which have a uh, quite uh, a pressure. Sure. Very good question. Again, a thing I didn't talk about uh, in any detail. Uh, if you run the machine learned force fields, uh, we use the classical ensemble. So we are not using, uh, so we are using essentially Maxwell Boltzmann statistics. So is this a good approximation? Here you see actually the red and here in this small graph here, I don't know whether you can see that. In this graph here, you see is the red line, the red broken line is the one obtained in the classical statistics and the uh, Bose statistics that in principle you should use is the green line. So this is in a quasi harmonic approximation where we can both calculate the uh, classic statistics as well as the Bose uh, statistics. And there is okay. no difference at higher temperatures. Of course, if we do Bose statistics, we would need to include the zero point vibrations at higher temperatures. Anyway, the difference is no longer that meaningful, right? I mean, they are, they are becoming identical, as you can see here. And in this case, for this material here, they become identical at something like uh, 100 Kelvin. Yeah, the both statistics are exactly. That's textbook. I mean, kind of, it's a nice thing to check it, and you need to check it all for any single material, obviously. Uh, and it's a nice case that we can really confirm classical statistics here is good enough. Thank you. Thanks, and uh, Daniela. Hi, um, I had a question about the elastic constants in zirconium. So for the HCP, HCP phase, it's, it's, it's perfect. It's almost exact. Yeah. And in the BCC phase, it's a little less accurate. I was wondering, if, yes. is there a reason for this? Is it just yes. kind of random? You can't get all of them? Is it just undersampled? No. I'm just curious. No, why. it's not undersampled. It's not anything like that. I mean, the point here is what we calculated here for BCC zirconium are the elastic constants of the perfect material. That is totally bogus if you look at the phonon dispersion relation, which has soft modes, right? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, if you want, it's a, it's a deficiency of our training set that has been trained for BCC zirconium at higher temperatures, right? We train at higher temperatures where this is not BCC, it's really randomly going around, actually, it's actually exploring locally as HCP-like structures. I, I don't mm. have time to go into this, but it's a Martin City phase transition, but it's really high entropy phase, this BCC zirconium, where the atoms are rapidly moving around in a kind of umbrella potential, really, in reality. So it's really an umbrella potential where the BCC is on top, right? You see the umbrella potential here already, that you have soft modes. So yes, it's under training, because we have very little information on the perfect BCC phase. Actually, that was a crucial point here. We put in a little bit, we cheated a little bit, put in a little bit training data on top of the on the fly training by actually considering structures around T is equal to zero that are having small displacements to get that information back in. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So this is the main reason for the bigger error, we believe. Okay, yeah. Uh, if I do a little other question, is there a reason why you guys didn't want to work with neural networks? And you, I guess, just because you could do your more sophisticated error analysis. Yeah, that makes sense. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. I think I, I will be very clear. I think neural networks are the way to go if you have a final force field. So we would preferentially recast the final force field trained on the fly, probably in the neural network potential. All the evidence we have is that uh, this doesn't jeopardize precision at the end of the day. So for on the fly training, I, I'm not so sure you can easily do it with neural networks. At least it's not so simple to on the fly train a neural network, right? I mean, at least I wouldn't know a good algorithm to do that. The nice thing here is that we can rely on linear algebra. So using the current trick, we have all this nice, you know, all this fallback on, on linear algebra. That's why I prefer this for the training. But ultimately, I believe neural networks is the way to go. And, I mean, there's a reason why human nature, humans and, and brain adopted neural network architectures because it's so flexible, fault tolerant and ultimately highly parallelizable. So I think neural networks is the final way to go. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Thanks. So let me take a question from the chat so we bounce back and forth. So Marco Fornari asks, uh, does the locality assumed in the approach limit the ability to describe a long range or collective interactions? <laughs> of course, no question. I mean, this is a major issue. Um, I personally, I mean, 
Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, in a ballpark, yes. I mean, of course, you would need long range descriptors to get any long range property described. So we can at most take into account medium range correlations. I'm well aware of the work that uh, Michele Teotti is doing and think this is very nice. For the applications we currently do, I think it's good enough what we do. That's, that's the key point here. I don't think this is the final word. I mean, there will be improved approaches possibly describing long range effects better. But again, for the properties we desire at this point, I think this is good enough. But the for the materials. The phonons you were showing yeah. uh, that the non analyticity at gamma. So I suppose you are fitting to the short range and adding uh, the dipole dipole interaction analytically. Yeah, this was done by color, right? So um, that's a good question. I should have checked. Do we have the, we don't have, a, do we have LOT splitting? Yes, she was certainly putting that in with phonon pi. So she was using phonon pi and she put in the, the long range electrostatic interactions that you would put in, I would guess, uh, if you do the first principle calculation. So it's a little bit of cheating. Okay. Okay, let me get uh, two questions from the chat. Uh, we have uh, Raymond, I can't see the full name, and then uh, Francesco Marquesca. Hi, um, thank you, um, first of all, for this uh, very interesting chat. Um, I was wondering if you could go to slide 28 about uh, the random phase approximation. Yes. Um, and I probably have uh, quite a naive question here, but you mentioned um, on this right, so this fourth bullet point where that the that it's free from the Poulet stress, and I was wondering, does that have to do um, with using a complete basis set, or is that having to do with um, maybe the methodology, or is this more yeah. something inherent to the random phase approximation itself? So first of all, be assured, this took us a month, really, to to two months. I think this was hard work, really, to to get the stress tensor right. First, we started doing this in DFT. In DFT, you have always this pulley stress error, right? So you have, right. if you have a finite basis set, you have always pulley stress error. And then we try to do it with finite differences. And yeah, the finite differences, if you do it just from energies, where the finite differences are typically, I think, one to one percent, say that's the kind of magnitude of distortion that we do. Now, if we do these finite uh, distortions, uh, we allow the base set to change. Okay, so we, if we do the finite distortion, we allow the base set to change. Therefore, this calculation is free of any base set fully stress error. So actually doing finite displacements is in principle more accurate, right? Because it avoids entirely this fully stress error. Because again, you adopt your base set to the new unit cell. Okay, so if you carry this over to RPA, yeah, you, you get you gain that advantage. Yeah, you are always pulley, also pulley stress free. So, uh, well, we were long we were considering implementing in the in the RPA the stress tensors as well. At the end, I think we will never do it. It's just too expensive. Uh, it will suffer from pulley stress errors, which in the RPA are pretty pretty much most likely even worse than for density functional theory. And doing it the way we do it here, we get more or less quite straightforwardly with 12 additional RPA calculations, we get essentially the stress tensor to a very high position without this uh, unpleasant pulley stress error. Thank you. So the pulley stress error is also there in DFT. And yeah, of course. Okay, thanks. Let me give the word to Francesco Maresca, then I'll take a question from the chat. Thanks, Nicola. Can you hear uh, my mic? Yeah. Uh, so I was uh, curious uh, about the Martin Siddig phase transformation. So going back, yes. um, and you show the case of zirconium-based systems, and you try yes. hard to predict the transition temperature, and uh, yes. and you say the hysteresis is not taken. But as far as I know, hysteresis depends on some pressure because the Martin site grows in a confined yes. environment. Yes nucleation of interfaces, motion of interfaces. So why being so much surprised? Might this be the case? Why upon cooling, you don't get what you expect? No, I mean, this is the only system that we had upon cooling. Uh, uh, the, I mean, in all the other systems, when you cool, you go not back. You do not go back to the 
high symmetry phase. HCP is in this case a little bit like a higher symmetry case, a symmetry broken PCC if you want so almost. So all the other systems we've considered at that point, this heating is always easy. So if you heat, you can always go to the higher entropy phase if you want so. Upon cooling, it's very hard to go from the high entropy to the low entropy phase uh, if you have a first order phase transition. So this is first order phase transition clearly because uh, your, your volume changes abruptly. So yeah, this was the only case where this simple naive approach succeeded. So this, yeah, I mean, I mean even if you don't use 180 atoms, if you use more atoms, you don't have this reversibility. You, you can't do this anymore. So 180 atom was a little bit of a lucky strike. Did this answer your question? I'm not quite sure. Um, it, partly in the sense here, for example, there is an hysteresis and you, for the experiments, you show a temperature, but generally there is, there is a martensitic start temperature Yes. And how tonight start temperature? What are the experimental values and how they compare with your prediction? I can only quote, I, I need to, would need to look into the literature. I can only quote this experimental phase transition temperature for the Martin-Sitic phase transition, which is one, uh, 1136. I haven't looked into the details for this. I would need to talk to Python who did the calculations to check out on this. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. Thanks. Let me take uh, a question from the chat from uh, Gunnar Schmitz. Uh, I think it refers to one of the early slides uh, where uh, you were uh, improving your training. And it says by selecting new points uh, based on the variance, uh, you do something which can be seen as Bayesian optimization. Uh, there, uh, one usually does not use the variance only, but uses an uh, um, acquisition function which account for uh, exploration and exploitation. Uh, this can be done by calculating the estimated improvement by adding a point. So did you try something like no. that uh, to avoid uh, too much exploration? No. no, really. I mean, maybe we were lucky that this worked so well. I mean, maybe this is an oversimplistic approach. Uh, I, I'm not an expert on machine learning in this respect. We maybe again, we were lucky that this worked as well as it does over exploration. Maybe I should say one more thing. We do a little bit more on top of this. We also do finally some additional, I mean, on top of this, we add actually some COR specification of the local environments in order to avoid oversampling. So there are additional steps. This is our main driver for selecting configurations. But again, we actually apply COR algorithms on the, uh, essentially uh, on the, I, I don't have that here, so I cannot talk about the details, but you can look it up in this paper here. Uh, we additionally specify uh, the number of local environments that we actually use to avoid, to avoid or over completeness. But if you can send me an email with, with uh, some literature that I should read, I, I'm, I would be very glad to look into what you are suggesting. Thanks. Um, that was Gunnar Schmidt. So maybe Matthias uh, Rupp, uh, live. Welcome for a minute. Hi, thanks. Um, I have a small implementation question. So uh, for Gaussian processes, for example, Rasmussen and Williams in their 2006 book recommend using Cholesky decomposition <clears throat> to solve the, the equation system with some tiny amount of regularization for numerical reasons. Could you comment on the um, numerical properties of this approach, like Cholesky decomposition versus the singular value decomposition to inverse approach that you mentioned you used? Okay, I cannot comment on Cholesky decomposition. I mean, the standard way from my point of view to solve uh, overdetermined. Okay, first, maybe one thing that is important. How large is the Bayesian? We use the evidence approximation to estimate both sigma v as well as sigma w. Okay, so the evidence approximation gives us some indication how large our regularization needs to be. Now, it turns out that if you run for sufficiently long, many steps, yeah, and if we do also a specification on the local environments, on the central atoms that we keep in our basis set, if you want so, then we are largely overdetermined most of the time. So actually, we have typically 1,000 local environments that we keep. And we have typically 60 to 100,000 equations to fill, to fit, right? 
actually because we have forces, energies, and stress tensors. So from a single calculation, you get, say, with 48 atoms, you get 48 times three equations for forces, six equations for the stress tensor, one equation for the energy. So the important thing here is all our indicators tell us we should not use regularization. We are totally and way overdetermined. Okay, this is point number one. So even our automatic algorithms tell us kick out the regularization, you don't need it, okay? Okay, now this year, I, I don't know exactly what to do. Of course, there are many ways to invert or pseudo invert in, in, in a linear regression problem. I mean, <laughs> honestly, it doesn't, I guess it doesn't matter. You could use a QR algorithm. That's the standard one that you will find in textbooks, right? We decided to use SVD because we, in the SVD, we can still do some regularization if we desire towards the end, right? So if you have the eigenvalues of the, of the design matrix, right? We can very straightforwardly reapply regularization if we desire. I mean, anyway, this is a final step and whether this final step takes 30 seconds or 30 minutes, doesn't matter. So this final step typically takes, if we run it, if we fit these 60,000 or 100,000 equations, this final step takes, yeah, 15 minutes typically, if you run in parallel with scalar and APEC. It's nothing outrageously big for now, for the computers that we have nowadays. And if you ask me, SVD is the, I mean, it's the most robust way of doing it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. SVD is the standard way of inverting a, a, an equation. So why not use that? I mean, so, maybe there are more efficient algorithms that are as stable, but why use them? It's not, it wasn't about efficiency, mainly. So, my, so your experience with the regularization, that coincides with what I see. Um, okay, the, the argument, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the argument for the Cholesky decomposition is numerical stability. So I agree that computational efficiency is not so much of a problem here. And I was just okay. curious how you, how you convert the, we, to your approach. Yes. So do they, do they invert the design matrix or the square up the normal equation? Sorry, can you say that again? Do they invert the normal equation, which is the equation above? Because oh, a lot of people invert they the, do the kernel equation. version. So you, you, you invert yeah, yeah, sure. the. This is, yeah. yeah, sure. This is also the psi here is a kernel, yeah. is, is exactly. kernel matrix. But do they invert the squared matrix or not? Well, you have. Well, they solve the system of equations. So you, you have sure. a lower, lower trigon, also, <laughs> diagonal yeah. matrix, right? And then you just insert it. Yeah, sure. Okay, I guess I guess they they replace the psi by the, so they they probably do they, they they yes so they probably take this rectangular matrix and uh, apply Koleski. What was it Koleski decomposition? Koleski, yes, yes, uh, Koleski decomposition. But that's not but symmetric, so it can't be Koleski. No, so it's, if, it's, they Koleski, it's... if they do Koleski, they do it to the squared problem. Yes, so yes. This one, yeah. This I don't understand. I mean, this is. I mean, honestly, I will be quite frank. I will be quite frank. I mean. When we submitted the paper, or the referee told us this is bullshit and he doesn't believe us. No, I mean, if you if you come from a different community that does regression, not from machine learning, you never ever square the equation. The conditioning number of the squared matrix psi transpose times psi is the square of the condition number of the original matrix. So you should never ever square. This is just outrageous if you do that. Why should you do that? I mean, if this is a huge, yes, it's a little bit more expensive, but nowadays, I mean, if you have 128 gigabytes on, on a single node, I mean, you can easily, easily uh, actually uh, do this thing, the SVD for such a matrix. It takes no time. I mean, maybe it takes 15 minutes. In most cases, it takes five minutes. You should never ever square. I do not understand why people are so pinned on this square. Yes, they are pinned on square because in machine learning, you are most of the time underdetermined. But here we are overdetermined. This is a very specific machine learning problem, this learning forces and energies. And there's absolutely no reason to square the equation. So just take the original equation, the psi matrix, so the design matrix, if you want so, and invert that. That's what I would recommend. But anyway, it's not such a big boost in, in, in accuracy anyway. So you can stick still to the normal equation most of the time. Yeah, thanks. Please. Thank you for your comment. Yeah, let, let me take a last uh, quick question from uh, Ben Wang. Hi, uh, Professor Caressa. Uh, thanks, thanks much for the informative talk. Actually, I have a question on your slide 11. So when you are doing a prediction of the potential energy surface, how did you determine the uncertainty threshold 
So for me, it's kind oh. of just a human yes. decided value, right? Absolutely. If you want, so this is our, this is the biggest problem we have, quite honestly. Okay. Okay. So determining the threshold is the biggest problem we do have. And actually, we, we, we are kind, kindly constantly, I mean, this is where a little bit of uh, user control is absolutely required. So mm -hmm. the user needs to look into this and needs potentially to change that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we have some defaults that work very well, but if people get into it, say Carla Verde and uh, Baitao, they are really checking this threshold, the automatic thresholds careful, and sometimes you need to play with it. So we have some defaults if you want so, but I I wouldn't say it's entirely bulletproof or the sil the gold how you say silver bullet right? It's not the silver mm -hmm. bullet. It, it's mm -hmm. the, the one thing where you have to be yeah, careful, I would say. So okay. essentially, what we do is now we mostly take averages of previous uh, Bayesian errors. So it's really not okay. very intelligent, right? Okay. Uh, but the user can also fix it. Okay. The uh, that's... Okay. Uh, Sorry. I think I have last one quick question. No, I so... think that Ben, I apologize, but I think because we need to close the broadcast oh, okay. uh, in, in less than three minutes. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I'm, sure. I'm very Sorry. Sorry. And, uh, and I wanted to ask uh, one uh, sentence uh, questions to, to, to Georg uh, before, uh, before wrapping up. Um, Georg, if the 80s uh, were the decades of total energy, the FT calculations, and maybe the 90s molecular dynamics, uh, and then the next decade uh, was high throughput, uh, and uh, maybe we have done a decade uh, of uh, you know, building machine learning, uh, what do you think uh, will be the hot thing uh, for the next decade? <laughs> that's, not, that's not a serious question, right? <laughs> I have never been great in predicting the future, right? Uh, <laughs> No, I don't know. Predicting I don't know. new configurations. Um, okay. No, I, I, honestly, yeah, yeah, that's certainly important, but uh, I'm, I'm not a truth teller, right? I mean, I, I don't know it, but I think machine learning is in, an incredible step forward. That's what I think. So these machine learning force fields will really boost materials modeling if applied properly. That's what I think at this point. Yeah. Great. Uh, I apologize. Uh, we have to, to wrap this down, but uh, thanks again, Gerga. Fantastic lecture. Uh, and I'm sure everyone enjoyed it very much. Uh, and they can uh, all do a round of applause uh, for you. And this will be recorded for posterity. So mind what you say. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks again, Georg, And thanks, everyone. Thank you. It was a pleasure.